All right. Now, one of the interesting things is, uh, uh, I'd like to say I appreciate everybody coming over the YouTube channel. The viewing hours are unbelievable. What's going on right now? Um, you know, when uh, Bill and I talked about this and we were going to start it at first of the year, uh, we thought it would be a great topic that, you know, it's going to take us probably really about 16 weeks instead of 12. But the we wanted to do this because we thought this would be beneficial not only to the people and the groups that we have and all that, but anybody that comes on social media and that's prepping for their journeyman or master's exam. So even the journeymen that are following or apprentices want to become a journeyman are following along with this. You're actually learning some calculations that we'll get into that could possibly even be seen on the master's exam. So, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of prepping everybody for whatever test you're going to take. And it's been my experience, uh, the part that most uh, people, when they go in and take the test, they have trouble with is the calculations. And the thing I like to say when we're going through this, calculations are really not that hard. Once you understand the basic principles, the layout, format, and everything, then it just becomes a problem of knowing where to find the information in the code. And once you have that, you should be able to do this with no problem at all. And uh, uh, that's why we decided to do all this on calculation. So this week, we're going to finish up the exercise problems that was remaining for the wiring methods. And then we're going to get started into calculating conductor ampacities. Now, the first part of it is really not going to be extremely hard. It, it It's going to be pretty easy. But as we get further into it, the calculations start getting a little harder, a little harder, and especially once we get into the overcurrent protection. But I'm when we get into overcurrent protection devices, I'm going to simplify that for you and give you a couple of rule of thumbs that'll help you remember what to do and how to go in and apply the calculations accordingly. Okay. Yeah, so, what I really like about the way you do it, James, is it just brings a lot of confidence and. Uh, you know, like even a guy like me, I got 27 years in the field and um, there's certain things I didn't know how to do. I just <laughs> never practiced them. I just never right. did it. And then all of a sudden you're asking me, well, you got this many number 10s, this many number 8s, this many number 12s, you know. And I was like, I, I don't know how to do that. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. uh, so it was really cool when you're just showing me and then like the first time after you did it, then it was easy. Then I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. And then we were doing some fun things. Uh, I know Willie Jackerson uh, went and got like 25 number 12s yeah. and a three quarter and stuff. <laughs> and we were I was trying to get you to calculate like how many number 16s I could fit in a three quarter and a one inch and stuff. So that kind of stuff is a lot of fun. And I just really appreciate uh, just having fun with you uh, through all these years. You know, that we're almost on our two year anniversary. So. Oh uh, yeah. It's been a, and that's been what's a lot fun, of fun is, is, just like you doing that, just putting all the conductors in that content. That's funny as hell. That's why I like doing this show because we do fun stuff. You know, we have a good time. Yeah, and, and all that number 12 I pulled out of the trash can, you know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah. it was it was getting ready to get thrown away anyway, so it's pretty right. funny. Okay, let's get it rolling here. Let's see what we got this week. All right, so for the first one where we started last week was um, – uh, looking at conduit fill here. Uh, I'm sorry, condolet fill. And when you come in and you look at this, one of the things that we were trying to talk about is uh, the size of the conduit body and what you were going to need in that in order to make splices in it. And right. as Bill stated last week, you know, he's found one. And you look at these condolets here, they tell you how much square inches are in them. So therefore, you know, if you have a condolet that's large enough in order to accept the spice fill that's going to be in there. So in this and when you go over and look at this, you're you're trying if you go over and look at 314.16 C1 is where you're going to pick up this. What you're going to do is you're you're going to look over at uh, chapter nine. Table four, and in this case, we're doing EMT and get the square inch of the EMT, which is 0.864, and then you just multiply it by two. That's all it is. And then from there, it'll tell you what you need there 
for making those splices and everything for the size of that conduit body, which is going to be 1.728 per inch. Okay. Yeah, and the the there was a there was a code teacher that basically said you couldn't uh, splice in a conduit body because you'll never get enough cubic volume to do it. And so then I went out there and I found like a one inch that had like 94.5 cubic inches or something. And I'm like, you could splice a whole 42 circuit panel. Out of thing. Yeah. So, and see, that's, that's what's interesting because it tells you what the size of the conduit body is in square inches here. Okay. Yep. And uh, one of the things we did, we gave you some calculation tips below there so you could follow along with all of this. And, and it's very simple so say i've got an lb that's got 28 uh square inches in it and i was putting number 12s in well if i divide that by 2.25 cubic inches it's going to give me 12.4 so you could put 12 number 12s in there very right. simple and and you you say well how do you know what that cubic inch is there well i take that that point three, four square inches, divide it by the 0 0.0133 square inches. And that's what's going to give me uh, that setup for the conductors allowed, which equals what? 26. So it, it's right. it's going back showing you here, depending on how you're setting this up and everything based on the tables and all that. That's how you go in and determine what the size of the conduit body is and all the fill that's required. OK, and that's what we're showing you here when you get in that. And we, and if you look in the illustration, we're telling you the LB there has 28 uh, cubic inches there capacity. So right. we're giving you the information. Then we're showing you how to do the calculation. And okay? and what, another thing too is just so you guys realize, like this is not necessarily going to be on the exam, but we're just showing you the math that you're going to use. And so. It kind of prepares you for any situation that they're asking that style question. That's right. Now that's a that's probably a calculation they may want to know how many conductors you can put in there. That'd probably be something for like a master, right? That they would hit you up on. But as okay. a journeyman, I think you need to know that because you're out okay. in the field. You need to know what you can put in there. Okay. Jump yeah, Now. Looking at this one here, this is where you do your straight or angle pulls. This is probably the most simplest calculation in the code, in my opinion. If you go over and look at 314.28, A1 and A2, A1 deals with straight pulls. You should know this off the top of your head before you ever go in. The multiplier is 8 for a straight, and an angle or U pull, the multiplier is 6. So if you have a straight pull, it's only one one uh raceway in there say it's a three inch you're just going to take the three inch times the multiplier eight and it's going to tell you the minimum length across there has to be at least 24 inches very right. simple then if i go where i have multiple raceways it's the exact same calculation you take the largest conduit which in this case is a four inch multiply it by the multiplier eight gives you 32 inches all the rest of them are zeros you don't even add anything. So the minimum length across there, you have to have at least 32 inches for your straight pull. Simple. Okay. Now, if I go to an angle or you pull, now you got the multiplier six. Now, if I had multiple raceways in there where I was doing angle pulls, then you have to count all the raceways where the angle pull is being used. Okay. Gotcha. So here I've got one uh, U pull they're doing here. So I'll take that raceway, which is a three inch, multiply it by six and that box, because you're doing an angle or U pull has to be 18 inches by 18 inches. Okay. Right. Now, if I come over here to I have multiple raceways, the exact same calculation, a three and a half inches is the largest multiply by six gives you 21. Then you add the rest of them together. So you right. got a two inch or one inch that gives you 24 inches. So the minimum length of that, that pull box has to be 24 inches by 24 inches. Simple, right. simple calculations here. Just remember, if you're doing an angle or you pull, go look in Article 314. And if you do all these enough, you'll know you're going to be looking at 314.28 A1 and A2. Yeah, right? I just realized I quoted that section wrong hmm. the other day. I was just no off deal. the top of my head. You know what I mean? I One of the guys was asking me what section and... 
I was I knew it was three fourteen. I thought it was three fourteen sixteen. So I've I've done that pa- before. Apologize. My, sometimes, apologize too. sometimes I'll get in and I'm I'm thinking way ahead on something, and I might say something that, that I wasn't thinking at that point. I was already getting to the you know two or three steps down the line, and I'll quote something wrong. I've done that right. before. Doesn't mean it's I don't good. know it. It just you know you just <laughs> getting into something else now you'll remember me saying this last week and i well two weeks ago i've I've said it for two weeks straight whenever you're doing box fill and you're doing conduits fill you're either going to be dealing with same size conductors or different size conductors okay now when i'm doing conduit fill if i have all the same size conductors you're going to look in annex c okay so like this and we're doing rigid metal conduit you got four number sixes. I'm not going to tell everybody the table. Let everybody sort of go and look this up. Y'all were supposed to. And you go over, look in Annex C. I'm going to pick that table up. And I'm going to pick up here uh, uh, number six. At the top right-hand side of that table, it goes across. And I'm going to pick up the number six conductor. And I'm going to go down, see how many conductors that I can put in there up to four, come across the left, and it's going to tell you the size raceway you need. In this case, the rigid metal conduit that you would need would at least need to be a three-quarter inch. That's a simple calculation. You just got to know where to go get it from the table. Now, And just so you guys know, I let James use uh, my house as an example. I have my my stove wired up, hardwired with uh, (laughs) RMC. (laughs) Well, I was trying to uh, show there's no outlet there. <laughs> now, this one here, this gets to be interesting here. Because if, if well, actually, there was a plug back behind there, but <laughs> I'll leave that off. Now, if, if uh, you look at this one here, I've got number 14, I, well, I got number 10, okay? So I have right. 12 number 14s, four number 12s, and four number 10s that are going uh, at that junction box there, okay? Now, what you're going to do, you're going to go look at Chapter 9, Table 5. That's where you're going to get the square inch. Now, we went ahead and put the square inches here so you could go find the conductor so you know you were in the right area for the square inch when you were selecting this, all right? So if I had 0.0097 square inches, that was a number 14 conductor. 0.0133 square inches, that was a number 12. 0.0211 square inches, that was a number 10. All right? So then I'm going to take all those square inches, and I'm going to put the number of each one of them. So for the 14, I had 12 conductors. For the uh, number 12, I had four. And for the number 10, I had four. So you just take them across, add them up for the number 14s. You had 0.1154 square inches. For the number 12s, you had 0.0532 square inches. And for the number 10, you had 0.0844 square inches. Add all those up, gives you 0.254 square inches. So now what you're going to do is you're going to go to Chapter 9, Table 4, find the table for electrical metallic tubing. Then you're going to come down where... It, it talks about over two conductors come down and find the next size that is above that 0.254. Then you come across all the way to the left, and it's going to tell you you need what size uh, EMT, a one, one inch. inch. Yep. Very simple um, to follow. I kind of like to, um, just so everyone kind of pays attention, because you show that, that 40% fill on that raceway, if you were to shorten that to 24 inches or less, then you could do up to 60% fill. That's going to be here right on the next one. Gotcha. Awesome. <laughs> okay. And, and this is where you get into a nipple. I've got 14 number 8s, 12 number 10s, 9 number 12s, and 9 number 14s. We gave you all the square inch values so you could go find the conductor that matches up. So once again, 0.0133 square inches, that's a number 12. 0.0097 square inches is a 14. 0.0211 square inches is a 10. And 0.0366 square inches is 8. Then you just take, put the uh, number of conductors you had for each one of those. So um, looking at this, I had nine number 12s. 
and then I had nine number 14s, and then I had 12 number 10s and 14 number 8s. Just take that cute, that square inch area for each one of those conductors, time the number, come across, and here's your values. 0.1197 for the uh, number 12, 0.0873 square inches for the number 14, uh, 0.2532 uh, for the uh, number 10, and 0.5124 for the number 8. Add all those up, that's going to give you 0.9726 uh, square inches. Now, what I need to do, you can do this easy way, but we're going to show you how to do it, but you can actually go over to Chapter 9, Table 4. They now have a column there for the 60% fill that you can go down and, and find the, the one and a half inch that's above that 0.9726 square inches. But how did they get that value? Well, if I look at a one and a half inch and I take and do that at 100% total fill, which is going to be over in Chapter 9, Table 4, that's going to give you 2.036 square inches. Take that at 60% is going to give you 1.2216, which you'll see that's the value that's right above the 0.972 six square inches in chapter nine, table four for the uh, EMT conduit. Okay. Yeah. And you can look at like an inch and a quarter too. And like an inch and a quarter is probably be like 0.961 or something. So it's going to not be, uh, a, a, you know, it's not going to have enough room. <clears throat> it's not going to have enough room to accommodate those conductors at 60% fill. That's correct. And you will I'll tell you that. what, I'll tell you what, that you couldn't tell that to Willie, man. He got, he got all those conductors in there. He man. showed you could get them in there. Dude, I, was, I can't believe he didn't use soap or anything. All right. Now, this is um, uh, where we're dealing with the auxiliary gutter. And uh, you can look at a wire way. I don't care what you want to call it. But how do I go about this? Well, we got three number 250s. That's in the illustration. We got three four alts and three one alts. Okay. Now you'll notice we gave you the square inch value again. So you're going to go to chapter nine, table five, and we'll tell you for, for 0.397 square inches, that's a 250 KC mill conductor. For 0.3237 square inches, that was four alt. And for 0.1855 square inches is a one alt. We had three of every one of them. You're just going to multiply those together uh, by three. So for the first one, which was the 250 KC mill, multiply it by three is 1.191 square inches. For the four alt, we get 0.9711 square inches. And for the one alt, we get 0.5565 square inches. Add all that up together, gives you 2.7186 square inches. Now, we looked at this the other day. If I'm, if I'm doing the fill there, I'm going to divide by 20%. Okay. But if I'm going to do uh the splices and stuff we took it at what 75 percent everybody remember that if you go back and look at the the last video we did i went through that so here i'm just doing the fill so i got 2.718 square eight six square percent that's going to give 13.593 the next size above that based on the chart we actually have the charts in our design book and german book it goes over this but i would just take a four inch by four inch auxiliary gutter, multiply that, that's going to give you 16 square inches, which is going to contain the 13.593 square inches. Nice. Okay. And it's sort of like when we did the boxes, you know, we had the other boxes and I might've calculated and I need a, a six by four by four box. You see what I'm saying? So right. it's the same concept here. All right. And then you get into cable trays. And the same thing that we were dealing with this is you're going to go over and you're going to look at the tables. In this case, this particular one's the one we see mainly that would be on a test. And you'd be looking over. There's a lot of different ways you can do cable trays, but this is the main one. If you go over and look at 392.20 C's where you're going to get this information. And we have... Uh, 300 KC mil and 100 KC mil. We got 14 of those 310 of the 1,000. So we gave you the square inches again up top. 0.4608 square inches per table, uh, or chapter nine, table five. 
is going to tell you you need a 300 kc mill and for the 1.3478 square inches is a 1000 kc mill so i'm just going to do the the three the three the 300 kc mill conductor had 14 of those multiply all that together gives you 6.4512 square inches and then I do the 1,000 kc mill. I had 10 of those. It's going to give you 13.478 square inches. Total that up gives you 19.9292. And then I'm going to go over look at the table. And you, I'm, I, I'm not going to go through all the table. I'm going to let y'all look it up. You come over, look at that table. You're going to come down, and you're going to look in there, and you're going to find the cable tray that is above the 19.9292 square inches. Then I come across to the left-hand side, and it's going to tell you the table or the, the cable tray that is above that is a 24-inch uh, cable tray. Okay? Yeah, that kind of that kind of gives me some flashbacks back to the plant because we ran miles of that stuff. And sure. And we, it, it really isn't that hard uh, to follow if you know what you're looking for. And yeah. one of the, the things that... Um, uh, we we actually used to have it, and we still got the material, but we have it in our old calculation book that we did. And we actually went through and showed you all the different calculations that dealt with cable trays. There was probably eight to ten of them in there. We show you where you're doing cable trays and you're doing control wiring. How do you go about calculating that? Because now control wiring is contained in a cable, isn't it? So yeah, we so show you we, how to get those 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 square inch values in order to calculate to know what the size of that cable tray is. What we would have to do, like in our in this situation, is we would have to oversize it. So whatever this says, we'd have to go to like thirty inches. Oh, that's okay. And then and then we'd have to stack all those conductors in triangles. Mm -hmm. And it was. And it was crazy to try to keep those conductors to stay in those triangles for miles. It was just ridiculously hard. Yeah, and it goes back to uh, that. This is minimum. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? You can always no, go I, above that. I agree. Okay, so that's going to bring us to where we would get into Chapter 7, um, dealing with our calculating conductor impacts. Now... What we're going to do, we're just going to do the basics to start off with, and then we're slowly going to get into much more complex calculations, okay? And they're really not that complex if you know what you're doing. And I'm going to explain yeah. the things that you need to look at in order to perform these calculations correctly. So the first thing I'm going to get into is I want to discuss terminations because terminations are important because you need to know which amperage to use based on the termination you're connecting to. Okay? Copy. So the first uh, example problem here is what is the ampacity of a number four THHN copper conductor that's connected to an overcurrent device supplying power to equipment? And we're telling you, every terminal from the panel over to the equipment you're connecting to is rated for 75 degrees C. Okay, yeah. so if if I go over and I'm looking at table 310.16 and I pick up the 75 degree C column, I come down, it's going to be the number four has an ampacity of 85 amps. Okay, yeah. now everybody needs to learn that. Now, it, let's change this a little bit. Let's say that I was coming from the panel and it was rated 75 degrees C, but I'm going over here and there's an old motor or something, and it's 60 degrees C. Now what you're going to have to have is a breaker in the panel board that's rated 60 slash 75 degrees C, and now you're going to use the 60 degrees C column. And okay? you actually default if those terminals are unknown as well. That's right. You default. That's right. Temporary. Okay, now. Look at this here. here here's going to be your illustration. And we're going to show you here. Look at the panel board. What's it rated at? 60 degrees C. But the newly installed equipment is what? 75 degrees C. So now which, which column do you think you're going to use here? 
you're going to use the 60. Okay? And these are the things that we like to point out here is based on what you're connecting to. All right? Now, here's another one. What is the opacity of a one alt THHN copper conductor connected to an overcurrent protection device supplying a panel board? Well, everything's 75 degrees C rated here because I'm over a certain size. I'm not going to tell everybody because I want y'all to go look at 110.14 C1A and B. So I'm over a certain size here. So I know if I have a one alt conductor, I'm going to be in the 75 degree C column anyway. And if I look at table 310.16, come down for a one alt conductor, it's going to tell you it's good for 150 amps. Okay. All right. And then we'll have another table right here and look there. All the terminals are matching up to what? 75 degrees C. You shouldn't have a problem going in, picking this up and to determine the rating of your overcurrent device and everything that's there. Well, we already give you the overcurrent device rating there. Okay. Right. So, and we're telling you there's a 218 amp non-continuous load there. All terminals are rated 75 degrees C. So I have to have right. something above 218 amps. I know what the answer is, but I'm not going to give it right now. But, right. And that will match up showing that the conductor is at least equal to or exceeding the rating of what? The overcurrent protection device. Right. Okay. So this is our start. So everybody understands how to use the 60 and 75 degree C columns. All right. Now, let's get in and start looking at the current carrying uh, capacity of these conductors. Now. The first one we're going to do here, we're going to ask you, what is the current carrying opacity of nine number 12 THHN copper conductors pulled through a three quarter inch electrical metallic tubing? And we're telling you here, every one of these conductors are current carrying. OK, yeah. so I've got nine conductors that are current carrying. All right. So what's going to happen is, first of all, and I want to point this out and I, and I would recommend everybody that's watching this get familiar with, with where i'm telling you to go now at first we looked at 110.14 c1a and b didn't we but also yeah. when you look at 110.14 c you're going to look at the last sentence that's in there and basically what it's going to get into it's going to talk about adjustment and correction factors and it's going to tell you you are permitted at this point to use the higher rated insulation rating. Okay. Now right. our terminal rating. So when I go in and I look at table 310.16, you're going to see 60, 75 and 90 degrees C. Okay. Right. This is the only place I know where you're going to come in and use the nine degree C column. Okay. Right. But you have to remember this. When you get in and you start doing the, the calculation for this, that this is where you're going to have four or more current carrying conductors, or you are going to take and you're going to be going through an ambient temperature that's above 86 degrees Fahrenheit, for example. And the reason right. I know this, because if you look at the top of table 310.16, it tells you it's for three or less current carrying conductors and an, amb an ambient temperature of 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Anything above that, then you got to drop back and go look at table 310.15B and table 310.15C is where you're going to get this information. Okay. So let's right. start it off. I've got number 12 conductors. I've got, uh, four more current carrying conductors. In this case, I've got tw I've got nine of them. So I look at table 310.16 based on 110.14C, I can use a higher terminal rating and that will be the 90 degree C column and for number 12, that'll give me 30 amps. And mm -hmm. since I have four more, I'm gonna apply an adjustment factor here and I'm gonna look at table 310.15C1. And it tells me there for nine current carrying conductors, I have to put a multiplier of 70%. So I'll take that 30 amps times 70%, and that's going to limit it to 21 amps for each conductor. 
well, now if I've got a 20 amp breaker there, this is going to be large enough. I'm going to have enough amperage there for each one of them conductors for those 20 amp circuits. You see what I'm right. saying? Okay. Yeah. So that that's how you're going to do an adjustment factor. And then we'll have you a, another exercise problem here. And you're going to see we just do four current carrying conductors and you have number 12 and the rated THHN. Now, there's one other point I want to point out about this. If I go back and look at the other here, I want you to see up at top, we're telling you it's THHN copper conductors. All right. right. Now, if you go back, because we just covered this in, in the, um, or should I say the table was there in the myth we covered this week. You're going to okay. see the table there. You're going to look at table 310.41. And when you go over there and you pick up THHN, it's going to tell you there that that insulation's rated for what? 90 mm -hmm. degrees C. You yep. see that? And yep. then if I go look at THWM, what is it rated for? 75. Uh, 75. Yep. Now, if I change this problem, which they could do this to you on the test, they could have exactly this four current carrying conductors, number 12 THWN. You no longer can use a 90 degree C column. I would have to derate from the 75 degree C column. Yes, sir. Okay. I just want everybody to understand that. And all these little tips I'm giving you here, these are things that you need to think about when you're looking at the calculation, it's not really hard to, to, to look at it, but just make sure you know exactly which type of conductor you're dealing with. So you know exactly the terminal ratings that you're going to use when you apply table 310.16. Okay. Yeah. I always, I always remember my teacher when I was like the first, second year, um, basically saying that if you could guarantee the ambient temperature would never exceed 86 degrees, like if you're like in Alaska or something, mm -hmm. that you could upsize your conductors by 0.4% or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, and here, here's one with an ambient temperature. Uh, uh, when you look at it, we got 120 degrees Fahrenheit we're running through. Now, I'm using THHN, so that's good to use a 90 degree C column, and you'll look at table 310.41 on that. And then I go look at table 310.16, it's gonna tell me the number 10 is good for 40 amps. Then I go look at table 310.15B1, 120 degrees Fahrenheit requires a multiplier of 82%. And you're gonna look over on the right hand side of that table, and it's gonna give you a bunch of different ambient temperatures in a range there. And then you'll come over and depending on which type of conductor you're using, you could have a 60, 75, 90 degree C column there. This case, I'm 90 degree. Come across 82%. If I was coming over, I might be in the 75 degree C column if this was THWN. Okay. But since I'm in THHN, it's 82%. So you just take the 40 amps time 82% uh, and it's going to limit that conductor for each one of those conductors of 32.8 amps okay yeah and one, one thing we covered too james which is kind of important with that that you guys have to keep in mind if you're only going through that ambient temperature for less than 10 percent of the run then you don't need to derate it yeah matter so. of fact we have that right there we talk about route to an ambient temperature and we tell you to look at 310.15 B2 exception. <laughs> we put gotcha. those in there for things for you to look at, you know, yes, and, and that's yeah. one of the things when you come in, you look at our publication stuff, we have all this additional information for you to look at. And it's just to make you think about things that could be on the test. I doubt they'll yeah. get into that, but it's there. I always like uh, for you guys to look at uh, James's publications and he always has the code loops in there. So all yeah. those code loops go through with all the different loops that you have to go through to just verify that you're on the right track. Sure. And that's why we put everything in there. You know, those code loops, once you start following those code loops, you start figuring out this is not really as hard as you think. And that's something I don't see other publications doing. They don't put those code loops. 
And mm-hmm. and I understand why, because every time you got to update a book, guess what? You got to there. There could be a ton of changes that have to happen. You know, it was sort of like when we did our uh, our grounding chapter. When you go back and look, they they basically took the code book and laid it out exactly like our grounding chapter. The only thing we actually had to do in there was go in and change all the section numbers. They were all right. new at that point. So, right. the, you know, but those things that you learn. So anyway, yeah. you're going to come to this exercise problem. You've got number eight THHN, so you know your 90 degrees C column, and you're running through an ambient temperature of 125 degrees. So get the amperage for the number eight in the 90 degrees C column. Get your percentage for your correction factor for 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Take the amperage, multiply it by the percentage, and that's what the ampacity is listed to for each one of the conductors. Okay? And then you could take and have uh, uh, two uh, factors that you need to apply to this. So in this case, I've got six current carrying number 14, and I'm routed through an ambient temperature of 106 degrees Fahrenheit. But I'm still using THHN, so I can use the 90 degrees C column. So I go look at table 310.16. That's good at 25 amps. For six current carrying conductors, I have a multiplier of 80% for table 310.15 C1. And then I've got 106 degrees Fahrenheit. I need a multiplier of 87% in the 90 degrees C column for table 310.15 B1. Take all those percentages, multiply everything uh, with the 25 amps, and that's going to limit each conductor to 17.4 amps for each conductor. And in other words, it's probably going to be large enough because you got number 15 you got 15 amp overcurrent protection devices there for a number 14. And to verify that, most of the time that's going to be a small conductor rule. This is probably not going to a motor or something. And you go over and look at NEC 240.4B, and I'm sorry, 240.4D, and you come down and you'll see it'll say small conductors in the heading, and that'll be your small conductor rule. Okay. So on that one, that 14, you were sizing that off the 90 degree C column, right? Yes, because it was THHN. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And then you got another one here, same thing. You got eight current carrying conductors. It's number 12, THHN. I'm routed through an ambient of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So use the 90 degree C column. You get your adjustment factors for the eight conductors. And then you get your correction factor for the 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Take the amperage of the conductor, multiply it by both percentages, and that's what your conductor is going to be limited to. Pretty simple. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, this one gets a little, this is going to be more for a master. Okay. This is going to be where you have a raceway. We're sort of doing the same things, but I have a 50% load diversity that's located in the same raceway. Okay, so you're gonna, you're still gonna use. I got THHN, so I'm still gonna use the 90 degrees C column to get my amperage for the number 12, which will be 30 amps. But where this gets to be a different play here is you're gonna have to go look at Annex B and you're gonna pick up table B.211. Okay, and since I have diversity in here, in other words, what they're saying is not all these conductors are going to be loaded at the same time. Right. Okay. That's your diversity. So for 16 conductors, it's going to tell you here, you need to take that at 70%. Well, if I take the 30 amps at 70%, it's going to limit the ampacity to each one of those conductors to what? 21 amps. But since it is a diversity where 50% of them are not going to be operating at the same time, that means that only eight of those can have that ampacity rate. Right. Okay. And that's gotcha. something that a master could see on a test. Here I've got 28 of them, number 12. Okay. And we put a note in there. Half of them, only 14 are going to be current carrying. So this is where you're doing what? A 50% low diversity. Only half of gotcha. them are going to be current carrying. Okay. okay. Now, there's one more. 
Now, this one is a little bit different because this is where I got, this will be a master one too. This is where I got 12 number 12 THHN copper conductors. And it says where there are 16 conductors pulled through a raceway. Okay. So you're, you're determining basically four of those conductors are not going to be what current carrying, but I do have 12 of them. So there is a diversity here. So you're basically just ignoring the, the other four that are in there. So you're going to have a formula for this. It's a square and you're going to square root this. You're going to take 0.5. Okay. That's going to be a constant in the calculation. Then you're going to take the number of conductors that are pulled in, which is 16. And then that's going to be divided by 12 because 12 of them are current carrying. Okay. And you square root that, that's going to give you 82%. Okay. And then you're going to take the 70% derating factor on that. All right. And where did the 70% derating factor come? That come from what we just did in the previous um, uh, calculation. So you'll take 82% times 70% times 30 amps. And that's going to limit the ampacity for those 12 number 12 THHN copper conductors to 17.22 amps. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty important because you're still over your 80% there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have never seen this calculation. Okay. Yeah, I, dude, honestly, I, I'll be honest. I haven't seen it. Yeah. And when you look at this, all you have to remember when you get over there is go to Annex B and when you get over there, you're going to be looking where you have diversity in it. Now, if it's half diversity, you know what to do. If I'm coming in and it's not half and I've got uh, just a few conductors running through there that are not current carrying, now you're going to have to take the, the number of conductors and then you divide it by the number that are going to be current carrying. So like in this case, I have 0.5 time 28 divided by what 20 conductors because we have a note there telling you 20 of them are current carrying then you get your percentage right. and as you go look at this table you'll start seeing the percentages and stuff you're going to apply once you do the calculation and then of course since it's a number 12 and it's thhn i'm using the 90 degree c column which is going to be 30 amps okay dude i'm telling you i've been doing it all wrong all these years like all I have to do is just tell that inspector, dude, you don't know that these, all these conduits in 2024 are freaking diverse. <laughs> like, dude, we could put so many colors in there, dude. Yeah. And, and all of this is a good learning uh, mechanism yeah. for people to follow because a lot of people just never seen this stuff before. And yeah. that's why I decided to do it for journeymen and masters. And, but okay. I still feel like, what I'm showing there, that's an important thing for a journeyman to know. You're oh, out man. in the field. It'd be good to know you could have diversity in there. Oh, dude, we're going to pack our conduits. <laughs> like, you wouldn't believe, man. Like, dude, load diversity. I'm going to even label them. Now, this, and I'm going to bring this up. I want everybody to listen to exactly what I'm about to tell you. I don't care if you're doing the service calculation here. I don't care if you're doing a feeder or you're doing a branch circuit. If you have a continuous load for Article 100, that's any load that burns for three hours or more. That's a continuous load. You take it at 125%. All non-continuous loads, you take it 100%. So it doesn't matter if I'm doing this for a service, I'm doing it for a branch circuit, or I'm doing it for a feeder. That's what you will remember. So. Here's the sections you're going to look at 230.42A1. And then when I get to a feeder, I'm going to look at 215.2A1. And then for the overcurrent device, 215.3. And then when I get over and I look at uh, my branch circuit, go over and look at 210.19A. And then when you get over and you look at the overcurrent device for it, you're going to look at 210.20A. You're going to see practically the same language. Okay. It's just different things. So here I've got 78 amps of continuous load and 72 amps of non-continuous load. Very basic. If it's continuous, you take it at what? 
125%. So 78 amps times 125% gives me 97.5 amps. Non-continuous was 72 amps. Take it at 100%, 72 amps. Add that up, so 169.5 amps. I go look in the 75 degree C column for table 310.16, and the next size above that is 175 amps. Come across, and it'll tell you you need at least a two alt conductor. Nice. Okay, pretty simple. All right, yeah. same here. I've got 74 amps of continuous load, 62 amps of non continuous load. That should be easy for everybody to add up and determine what size your uh, THWN copper conductors are. All right, now look at this. Yeah. I'm coming in and I've got a continuous load of 130 amps, non-continuous load of 35 amps. How do I do this? And this is for a feeder, okay? Look at the section, 215.2A1A. Did I just say that? Yeah. Okay, 130 amps, continuous at 125%, gives me 162.5 amps. 35 amps of non-continuous loads, 100%, 35 amps. Add it up, gives you 197.5 amps. Once again, I go to table 310.16 for 75 degrees C. The next size above that is 200 amps. Come across, and it's going to tell you you need a 3 alt conductor. Pretty simple, okay? Yeah, and, and just, so, just so there's no confusion, too, um, and a lot of people don't really mention this. I notice a lot is that the, a continuous load is running at full load so like a lot of people think like and well james and i saw this before where we're in comments a lot of people think well a, a refrigerator is a continuous load no it's not it does not run at full load for three hours or more that's right so you just have to keep that in mind a lot of things are considered like um like you look at an ebse um you know you, you might not have to charge it for three hours or more but it's gonna be calculated and considered as a continuous load because it's gonna be uh assumed to be running for at full load for three hours or more sure so and it's they, just something to keep in mind on that and and they added in this last cycle uh to calculate that separate like they yes. uh, do AC units and everything else. And, and uh, yep. uh, we actually have added that into our calculation for the 2023. But this one, we won't have it because it's 2020. Unless, unless it's like four below, then you could uh, reduce your calculation by 40%. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, this illustration, you got 40 amps of continuous, 150 amps of non-continuous. You know continuous, 125%, everything else 100% that's non-continuous, add it all up, then go to table 310.16, 75 degrees C column, and select your conductor size. Now look at here. Here's a branch circuit, okay? I got 18 amps of continuous, 6 amps of non-continuous. And looky there, 210.19A1 again, like I said. If it's yeah. continuous, you take it at what? 125%, non-continuous, 100%, okay? Yeah. So 18 amps, 125%, 22.5 amps, 6 amps of non-continuous load, 100%, 6 amps. Add it up, gives you 28.5 amps. Go to table 310.16. The next amperage above, that's 30 amps. Come across, tells you you need a number 10. Now, the right. thing I want to point out here, I did a service, I did a feeder, and I did a branch circuit. Did I change the calculation? No. Nope. No. It was just different sections. And yeah. that, you know, I've been in a lot of classes, and I never hear them explain it that way. A lot of times you have to look at calculations and remember some of the things are exactly the same. You just different sections to go get that information. And all you got to remember, if it's a service, it's in where? Article 230. If it's a feeder, it's an article 215. If it's a branch circuit, it's where? 210. That's yeah. where we went to do these calculations. And so you got this illustration, 10 amps of continuous, 27 amps of non-continuous. You should know now how to do that. Shouldn't be any yeah. problem at all. Okay? Yeah. And then we're looking at this, and we're just going to tie in with the overcurrent device here 
So what is what size THWN copper conductors and overcurrent device are required to supply continuous low to 90 amps terminate 75 degrees C com, uh, terminals? Well, if it's continuous, what I take it at? It's a branch circuit, 210.19A1A says I have to take it at 125%. That's going to give me 112.5 amps. I'm going to terminate at 75 degrees the next size above that for table 310.16 is 115 amp and I'm going to come across it's going to tell me it's a number two conductor. So now I've calculated this. I need to protect that conductor. So what is the next size over current protection device above that? If I go look at table 240.6A for standard ampere ratings, the next size above that's 125 amp over current protection device. Yeah, pretty simple. And so, now, so technically, you're protecting a 90 amp load at 125 amp overturn device. Well, a 90 amp continuous load. Right. Okay. Now, just just so it just so it makes sense to people, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, I do want to point something out here, and and this is one they tried to argue with me before, and then I proved them wrong. If you notice there in the step. The last section there we give you is 240.4B. Let me explain why we gave that to you. When you go over and look at 240.4B, it says you can take, it, it talks about devices that you're sizing rated up to 800 amps, okay? And yep. what it says, I can protect the load, or it has in parentheses, I can protect what? The conductor. The conductor. Okay. So yeah. in this case, I was protecting the conductor because the next size above 112.5 amps is going to be a 125 amp overcurrent protection device in table 240.68. But let me give you another example. Let's say that I did this calculation and I came up with a load of 58 amps. Okay. Now, if I go look at table 240.6A, the next size above that 58 amps is a 60 amp overcurrent protection device. But now, if I go look at table 310.16, and I come down and pick up the next size wire above that, which would be 65 amps, come across, it's going to tell you it's a number six wire. So I could take and protect the load, or I could protect the conductor, and the next size overcurrent device above that's a 70 amp. So in that case, I could add a 60 or 70 amp overcurrent protection device. True. See what I'm saying? And yeah, this one here, it just matched up 125 as being the next size. Yeah, so you're basically, your conductor's oversized for your overcurrent device on one scenario, or your overcurrent device exceeds the ampacity rating of your conductor. That's correct. And, like and say, I've been in a lot of classes. They don't tell you that stuff. You know, they're yeah. just showing you how to do a calculation. And, and that's why it's good to have something like this because everything's yeah. step by step. And then you actually get to fill in the blanks, work the calculations and try to figure it out and then come back the next week and see if you did it right. It, it's yeah, like, and it's like being in class. Yeah. And, and then what you guys get is you get a little treat where you get a like get a quiz on King James and <laughs> you know and and he gets to like uh show his excellent knowledge on boats this week. You know what I mean? Uh, I, and so it's gonna be awesome. I actually do know a little bit about boats. I'm sort of see? curious to see what the hell you wrote. <laughs> all right, all right. Well Okay. You, so this you one you got a hundred and eighty two you got a hundred and eighty two amp load and it's continuous and terminals are seventy five. Just remember, you're matching up based on the load or what? The conductor. Okay? So hopefully I explained that well enough that everybody understands what you're looking for when you're doing this type of calculation. All right? And uh, this one, this, this last one we're going to do tonight, uh, we're going to do here for a feeder, and it's the same thing. We're going to look at Doing a feeder, we're going over to a sub panel. You have a continuous load of 678 amps terminated on 75 degrees C terminals, and we paralleled it four times. Okay, so let's look how we do this. If it's continuous, what do I take it at? 125 percent. 
So 678 amps times 125% is 847.5 amps. Now, one of the things I like to point out here is it doesn't really matter. People get a little nervous when they see higher amperages like this. They, there's no reason to take and, and get nervous about this. Uh, a small amperage, large amperage, if they ask it like this, you just know if it's continuous, 125%, non-continuous, 100%. OK, so now I'm going to be looking at taking some conductors that'll be paralleled four times. That will be above that 847.5 amps. In this case, we're telling you it was four alt. They were good for 230 amps. So if you pick up the 75 degree C column, pick up 230 amps, come across, it'll tell you it's a four alt conductor. So you'll take the right. 230 amps times four. That's going to give you 920 amps. Now, pay attention to what I'm about to tell y'all here, okay? Now, you're going to see I went to a 900 amp overcurrent device. Let me explain why. And this is why I brought this up a while ago, and this is why we do these problems this way. If I looked at the last calculation I did, I said go look at 240.4B, okay? That was for uh, overcurrent devices that were rated 800 amps or less. Now we're in 240.4C because I'm over 800 amps. And it says the conductors have to have to uh, equal or exceed the size of the overcurrent device in 240.4C. So when you go over and you look at this, these conductors have to be larger than that. So 920 amps, what would be the next size below that? A 900 amp. But I also yeah. want to point out when you go look at table 240.6A, 900 amp is not listed as a standard size, but it is a size that can be purchased, but it's just considered a non-standard size. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you couldn't purchase, if 900 amp wasn't a non-standard size you could actually purchase, then you'd have to take it down to what? An 800 amp. Okay. But they right. do make non-standard top so this is probably more of a master question that they would ask to see if you even knew that and you would right. have to know you would drop it down to a 900 amp overcurrent device okay right. and then you'll see we got an illustration here and we have uh 758 amps of load there and they're all the loads are continuous and we're telling you one more time to parallel it four times and just remember right. When you do the calculation, was it over 800 amps? Was it less than? you got to remember those rules right there when you're applying 240.4B and C for determining uh, the overcurrent protection device. Okay? Right. And right there is where we're going to stop it tonight, and then next week we'll get in and we'll start looking at the taps. Nice. So hopefully everybody enjoys.